So we're just going to jump right in with our presentation. So today we're going to be sharing a PowerPoint slide with you. Um, there's a roughly 12 slides on it and we will make sure that we have enough time for for Vina to share share her share her views, her culture and her understanding on each of the talking points as well as you can see behind us we've got some um, beautiful pieces that we will be sharing with with you the audience as we go along. So again, uh, welcome to the virtual Métis Talks with Métis Elder Vina. Hello, everybody. So Mrs. Vina Flooney, me Cardinal, is originally from the Fishing Lake Métis Settlement, which is around the Frog Lake area. She currently lives in Dewberry, Alberta, where she has raised her, her two sons and she's got numerous grandchildren. Vina is actively involved in the Métis Nation Region 2, Alberta, and her culture and roots are very important to her and she's an active member of the Métis community. So first we're going to talk about the Métis flag and the, the symbol. Um, for those of you who are aware of what the Métis flag looks like, you can see it up there on, on your screen. And if you've ever noticed the different flags that we have at Lakeland College, we actually have a Métis flag which represents the Métis people on both our Lloydminster and Vermilion campuses. We, those TP flags were, those flags, pardon me, were raised back in this, the early spring of 2017, at which point Lakeland College was taking an um, that's when we kind of began our um, active role in the truth and reconciliation for all Indigenous people. And we also have a flag back here on the table, which um, the Métis Nation of Alberta has graciously provided to us so we can have, have that symbol on our campus as well for students to see. So the Métis flag is carried out as a symbol of co continuity and pride. As you can see, the infinity circle represents the two circles joined, meant to symbolize the joining of the two vibrant cultures, the European and the First Nation, thus producing the new distinctive, distinct culture, the Métis. Vina, did you want to share a little about, about the flag and the symbol? Yes, the flag was being the, the Métis flag has been used by the Métis people since uh, 18, about 1815. They used it mainly for uh, political and military purposes. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's also the, the uh, sideways number eight, people will say, but it's the infinity sign means that uh, infinity that the Métis people will be around forever. There'll be no ending to the Métis people. So a lot of people fly the Métis flag with pride because it's a symbol of our heritage, the Métis people. Am I supposed to say anything? Yeah, no, I think that's good. So some of you might have um, seen a Métis sash and maybe you, you knew the significance and the importance of it or maybe you didn't know what it really represented um, and it's got so many beautiful vibrant colors on it as you can see Vina's sash back here she's going to give us a demonstration today of how this sash was worn by um, the Métis men traditionally as well as how the women wear the Métis sash as well, um, just out of respect for the Métis men who, who, um, who pass away from, for fighting for the Métis people, for just all the battles and the hardships that the Métis people have gone through. So um, this is um, 
by Ms. Métis Sash. She's going to share with us her demonstration. The men wore, in, in the 1800s, the, the Métis men were used as pack horses for the fur, at fur trading time. And they used the Métis Sash to hold in, to hold um, for support because a lot of the young men died on the trail coming west from ambiblical hernias. And so the, the Métis women decided to save their men by making them sashes that would be multi-purpose. So the one thing was as support for them when they were, when they were carrying loads of of um, well, fur and fur trade and stuff like that. So they would wear it this way. Mine is too short, but anyway, they they would tie it. The married men tied their sashes on the left hand side, and the single men tied their sashes on the right hand side. So the women knew which which men were married and which one were single. And uh, they used it, there was so many, so many uses for the sash. So it's, it's kind of sacred to the Métis people, the Métis sash. So a lot of times when you do something special and if somebody presents you with the Métis sash, that's a very honorable thing to do for somebody that has done something special. And the women wore, well, mo, the, the sash was made for the men, but the women used it to, or wore it out of respect for the men that gave their lives for, for our, our people. So the women, when they wore the sash, they wore it and they would have their, their husband's sash or, or a special sash at special ceremonies. The women wore their sashes like over the shoulder like this, and the married women tied their sash on the left side, like so. And the single women tied their sash, wore on the other side, and tied their sash on the right hand side of. So this is how they would wear, the single women would wear their special sashes. And uh, the colors are in the sash have all very um, spiritual meaning. And I guess uh, they're all there, the colors of the, that are traditional sash colors, and they all have spiritual meaning. And uh, yes, and the uses that it, it had multi uses, the sash for the men. So it is very, very special to all purpose tool, I guess we'll call it. <laughs> but that's uh, mainly what it was used for a lot of a lot of uses. And just to add that the the sash was made by using a finger weaving technique, yes. which is yeah. um, which is a lost art. Last year, when I met um, the Métis Youth Coordinator from Bonneville, she actually had a table where where she showed some students how to do a little finger weave on a using a bracelet length. And it was pretty cool to see how intricate those finger weaving techniques that she had in order to, to create like a, a simple bracelet to a sash like this. So the Red River cart was a mode of transportation for the Métis people. Um, as voyagers of the land, they used this cart. This cart was a multi-purpose um, instrument for them it created opportunity for them to travel across the land as well as um, for a temporary form of shelter. 
They use it obviously for, um, as you can see in the picture there, for loading their families as well as loading belongings. And they would use this also as a watercraft when it came time. The wheels would simply come off um, the little bit of research that I did and the understanding that I have is the wheels would be removed from the, the axle and put underneath the cart. And then the cart would be then wrapped with um, hide or some form of a, a tarp creating that boat-like structure. And then that's how um, the Métis people would port, like, I guess, portage across the water and across the land. So these carts were characterized as more than just a vehicle for transport, but to symbolize a sort of mobility home to carry everything um, that was of value. And um, I think Métis and First Nations people are both very nomadic. So this was something that um, definitely the Métis people utilized to, to be able to get to and from. If you ever want to do a little bit of research on to, as to where the Métis cart took the um, Métis people, there's really cool maps that you can find online to see how, how far they traveled, what waterways they used from the States all the way throughout to kind of that Northern Alberta, just into BC. So Métis people are also very proud of their song and dance. Um, the top right picture, pardon me, the top left picture is um, a picture of Mr. John Arcand, who is the, who is accredibly known as the, the master of the Métis fiddle. Um, he is, he is well known around the Métis fiddling and um, the Métis fiddle is um, the primary instrument which accompanies the Métis jig. There's different types of fiddle styles, including the Celtic and traditional French songs. So you can just imagine what type of music was being created when um, the, set, the settlers first came to North America from the European places, and they started marrying and having relations with First Nations women. They brought what they knew for music and the First Nations people had what they had for music. And, and just the, the beautiful marrying of those two was what has created the Métis song, as well as the Métis dance. So for those of you who have ever heard the Red River Jig, and also if you've ever seen anybody do a Red River Jig, um, it's definitely a sight to see. It's amazing how, how quickly the dancing happens. Um, and how long that the dancers can withhold that stamina. Um, Bina's got a, sh a, a story to share about the Métis jigging. Yes, uh, first with the, I'll just say a little bit about the Métis fiddle music. It was, cut, the, the Métis people developed their own form of fiddle music and they took from the different European uh, sounds and they put it all together uh, for their own music and there was kind of a a lot of people say it's a different sound there's kind of a bounce to it to the uh, fiddle and the Red River Jig is um, it's very unique um, because they danced the their shuffles have to be the same as the music and they can't miss a step. And the reason why it's all footwork is because there, there's no, hardly no movement to their upper bodies. And the reason for this, I've been told, <laughs> was in the Métis communities, the priests, the Catholic priests were very strict for dancing and music and and they didn't want the people entertaining themselves with the with the song and dance. So the on on Sundays the priests would walk around the community and look in the windows of the Métis homes 
So that is the reason why they didn't move, move their upper body. So it was all fun work was because then the priests couldn't see them bouncing up and down and having fun. Their upper bodies were straight and not hardly moving. So the priest would walk on by and say, oh, well, those people aren't dancing. So it was a very bad sin to dance on Sundays. So that is why they developed the Red River Jig. And it was all different steps and they were very competitive people. So they developed their, I'm sure there's about 30 or 40 different steps to the Red River Jig. And that is how they developed that fancy footwork of the Red River Jig. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that's about all I know about that. that. Um, and last year, when I had um, the pleasure of meeting a lady by the name of um, Mrs. Desjardins, Maxine Desjardins, she actually is one of the very few people in the Frog Lake area who teaches the, the Red River Jig. So if anybody is interested in learning about the Red River Jig and just kind of like knowing more about that, if you want to reach out to her, I can definitely um, lining up with her information. I also can do the Red River Jig, but not too many different steps. I think I know three, three different steps to the Red River Jig. And it's definitely um, a dance that you can just get right into, even if you don't know any of the steps, because you you get into the rhythm, because yes. the, the, the music is just so, it's, yes, you just it's so inviting. Music. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is, and they have a and they have a special little bounce that that comes with the Red River Jig, like and 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 also the Métis fiddle. It has kind of a double a double. They throw in a double note or whatever you call that in the in the Métis fiddling, and I got another story to tell too about the <laughs> uh, the Métis fiddlers. They. Uh, it wasn't, they never, they played the fiddle. It was just passed down from generation to generation of fiddling families. There was no written music, like notes. They played all by year. And also the Métis people, the, some of them years ago, fiddlers, I don't know which one of them famous fiddlers invented the, uh, the tune that they called Whiskey Before Breakfast. And that tune that they played or they developed was played for John A. MacDonald uh, because according to the Métis people, he always had whiskey before breakfast. And by the time the decisions were to be made, he was already half drunk at, because he always had his whiskey before breakfast. So that was the story I was told about John A. McDonald and the, the fiddle tune, Whiskey Before Breakfast. Interesting. It's great to hear the stories that you have for additions yes. for topics, Lina. So the other beautiful thing about the Métis culture is the art and the beadwork. Um, just the vibrant colors, the... Um, just the sharing of what what they what they want to share with you visually um, like I mentioned the vibrant colors that's just something that you can definitely identify um, the different Métis styles of beading embroidery um, different types of artwork so Vina's just going to share with us um, some of the pieces that she's got here on display as well as um, her Métis um, jewelry that she's wearing as, and her embroidery. Yes, my dress has a floral. The Métis people, were their beading and embroidering was uh, famous for their floral work. So as you can see, the floral design on my dress is, is what you call embroidering. They, it was embroidered and they use silk thread 
if they could afford the silk thread. It was either cotton or, or silk thread that they used for embroidering. The silk thread was more vibrant and more bright, which they look nicer. My moccasins here, I'll just show you. My moccasins are also have the Métis beading on them. If you can see this, it's a floral design. And if you see anything with the floral design, uh, a beading that was done by a Métis person. And the embroidering is also Métis. And they, uh, yeah, they, they liked uh, the arts and crafts of the Métis people were very, very unique. And um, yeah, and the, that, that was Louis Riel's saying was, when, when, this is Métis week, by the way, Louis Riel was hung for supposedly treason. They had said he was hung for treason at, on uh, the 16th of November in Regina. And he said his last words were, my people will sleep for a hundred years and the arts will awaken them and they will all be strong again. So that's what Louis Riel said. And, and they are famous for their arts and their crafts. Their storytelling is another thing that they're, the Métis people are very famous for. We didn't have writing, we didn't write nothing down, like the language, we never wrote anything down. It was just passed down from generation to generation. So just the stories that we tell are just passed down to us from our families, our parents and our, and our uh, cookums and, and, and relatives. So the music and the art and all that stuff was never written down. It's just passed down through storytelling. So that's why we, we are also famous for storytelling because remember we remember all the stories our families told us. We didn't have books to read or anything like that. We just had to we memorized and also the Métis people are very, very good at sight learning because our parents taught us how to do things. They showed us how to do things. We never, they never wrote anything down. It was, you know, you, you come with me and, and you do what I do and you watch what I do. And then you, that's the way, that's the way we learned in our community we just watched and and then we did it nothing was written down mm -hmm. so that's where the storytellers come from and the sight learning people like me i was always a, when i went to school i had a hard time with reading and comprehending what was in the book because all my life i was taught how to do things, I was shown how to do things. So then when you go to school, you have to learn from a book. And I had a hard time, very hard time, um, trying to comprehend what was written in those books that we were taught at school. So, and I'm sure I'm not alone there. I'm sure there's a lot of people that had a hard time at school. And a lot of the men just said, well, I can't learn I can't do this, so I'm just going to quit. So that, that's what happened to a lot of people, the, the Métis people. Yeah. And I think that um, just to, to add what we do at Lakeland College, like we, we try and give students that hands-on learning because it is so important to have that, that theory as well as that hands-on because that's what reinforces that learning for students, especially for, for the young men because they, they need to be challenged with what they're learning and they need to kind of figure things out because they're very mechanical, right? Yes. Um, so yeah, the site learning is definitely something that that is 
um, yeah. But a lot of people, like a lot of the teachers that we had on the settlement, I'm just going by my, what, how I grew up. We had teachers come out of university, I guess it was university, and they would come to the settlement because, you know, they, if they wouldn't get hired in the main big cities and that because they needed experience. So they would, this is just my opinion, they would come to the settlements because none of the teachers, we lived so far in a bush, you know, 40 miles away from the nearest town. And so they would come to the settlement and teach in the schools and they couldn't understand why we couldn't learn the way they were teaching us. Hmm. Whereas we learned we were smart at home the way our parents taught us, but we went to school and we couldn't understand what the teacher was trying to teach us because they didn't show us. They put a book in front of us and, and that was it. So that's why we had such a hard time in school for us. Uh, at least uh, the people that I grew up with on the settlements. I was born and raised on a Métis settlement and, and uh, that's where we had such a hard time with the teachers. So the Métis people, um, are they, their language is called Machif, which um, just this morning I found out Machif is what the Cree people refer to the Métis people as, as Machif. And Métis is the French term for um, half-breeds. Half -breeds. Um, so the Machif language is what is the language of the Métis people. Um, so there are many different versions of the Machif language. And that's all based on kind of what what region, what territory you grew up in, where you live, um, as well as um, what your background is. If you were more Cree and French, then you would have more of that um, that kind of dialect, and the other ones would be like more. Um, what were you saying? What types of like some Celtic in there as well? From Scottish, yes, and English, like the settlers would come from England and Scotland and France, and uh, and it depend on what area they settled in, where the Métis people would. It it's kind of, the Métis language is kind of a mixture of the Plains Cree, the uh, whatever. Um, it would be maybe a little bit of English, a little bit of French or Scot Scottish or English. Uh, the Métis people were the most multilingual people in all of Canada because they knew all the languages and they just kind of all mixed them together to, and they formed their own language. So that's where, and the, the Machif language is being, um, I don't know if it's extinct or it's getting to be extinct because nobody speaks it anymore. So we're trying to bring back the Machif language uh, and they're starting to teach it more and more now. Um, there's still some people that can speak it pretty fluently. So um, it is a great language to learn. And yes, my grandmother spoke Machif because we only, we, in, in our community, we only had two room houses. And a lot of times my grandmother was mostly French and she would, she would get mad at my dad because he brought the wrong kind of wood in for the wood stove and her bread didn't cook right. So she, and I remember her, and I think she died when I was three or four years old. Remember her throwing sticks of wood in the stove and swearing, but she swore in French so us kids wouldn't repeat what she said. So we started to, to you know, we'd be listening to her. 
So that's how we learned for, uh, how to speak machip is by listening to our our grandparents or our parents because when they would, if they didn't want us kids to know what they were talking about, they would stop speaking English and and just start speaking Cree or French. So that's how us kids learned. But we were always afraid to say the words that grandma said in French because they were bad words. We knew they were bad words. So we just used them for our own entertainment and and jokes and stuff. But we were very afraid to say that, say those words to the adults because we'd probably get uh, not a very good response. So we never ever did speak those words that grandma said in front of adults, but we used them as kids to each other. So yes, yeah, so I'm glad to see that the, the Michif language is coming back. And um, yeah, the, the Métis people were very proud of their Michif language. Uh, and if I miss something, ask a question, in the, put it in the questions if I miss something. <laughs> awesome. I, I too remember hearing um, some, I guess it was Machif growing up, that my, that my hukam, my grandma, would, would have some words, some key phrases that we would hear and we, we just knew them as that um, growing up. Um, and in visiting with Vina and just talking with her, like there's a lot of similarities with how I grew up and how she grew up. So it's interesting to learn about um, most likely my background and my culture a little bit more. So that is very cool and interesting and that I get to visit with Vina and, and learn more about that. Um, so one of the, the positive things that COVID has provided for us. Yes, there are the positives that we have to keep looking at. Um, using fa Facebook and virtual um, platforms to bring back that Machif language. There's so many cool resources that are available nowadays where people can, can log on to the different websites. I've got a couple that are listed up there on the screen. Um, and there will be links at the back of the presentation as well to direct you to those websites but there is that language revitalization that is happening um there's constantly live live feeds on facebook where where people are sharing the pronunciation of words and just hosting those little informal classes online for people to learn because uh, a lot of people are interested in learning about their culture and learning about a new culture that they that they'd have no idea about so make sure that if you're interested in learning more about um, the Machif language, as well as any of the background information that we have been sharing today, you take a look at the two websites there, the Gabriel Dumont Institute Virtual Museum and the, the, the Learn Machif Connect and Learn site. So it is 20 to, two, to 3. Um, we kind of burned through that presentation quite quickly, but is there anything that you would like to to share, Vina, any extra stuff? Um, well, I got some stories. <laughs> I know we all like storytelling. We, um, yeah, we sat around, like I was born and raised on a Métis settlement. And after supper, my mother would tell us, well, if you girls got the dishes done, supper dishes done, I'll tell you the story. So she always told that that was our treat. We didn't have treats at home, but for the, for my parents to tell us a story, that was a treat for us kids. So we'd all sit around um, the in the winter time, the pot-bellied stove that was in the living room, and either my mom or my dad would tell us a story. Um, so we remembered those stories because a lot of times they were repeated because they only knew maybe five or six stories each. So the stories had to be repeated quite often. So we memorized a lot of the stories that they told us. And um, a lot of it was about fear 
uh, the young girls, the parents would tell them stories about the devil. And the devil came out after dark. And so that was a way of teaching us girls not to be out after dark because it was dangerous for young girls to be roaming around the town site or wherever after dark because that's when the devil came out. So, um, so yeah, we were always scared of the dark because we were, it was embedded in our brain that bad things happen to young girls after dark. And also, um, I want to speak a little bit about the medicines. We never ever went to the doctor. I remember in my childhood, we went to the, I went to the doctor once because I had a toothache and I had to get, I had an abscess tooth and I had to get my tooth pulled. But I don't remember going to the doctor. We always just, we lived off the land. We, we would go and pick medicine in the fall, roots and stuff because all the good stuff from the summer would go into the root and it would hibernate there mm. for the winter and spring it would come out again and, and regrow. But so we dig up the roots because that's where all the good medicine was in the roots. And my parents would boil up stuff for us or, or make us chew roots or something for medicine. And that's how we were born and raised. And now they have these doctors. You go to the doctor and he gives you pills. And our bodies were never, ever accustomed to all the chemicals and whatever's in those pills that the doctor would give us. So we, our bodies were used to the natural, what grew on the earth. So that's how we um, that's how we lived. And now the young people are using drugs and that, and their bodies, our native bodies aren't accustomed to that stuff. It was like the alcohol that the traders traded for furs in the 1800s. They brought the alcohol to the to the Metis and and indigenous people to trade for furs and it made them crazy and that's how they my opinion again stole our land <laughs> i don't know if i should be saying this <laughs> but that's what we were that's how we were raised so yes yeah. okay Next, next. And, and Vaughn, I just want to mention that this summer, like at the end of summer, uh, you ended up joining us on our medicine walks that we took in our Vermilion campus. So we are so very thankful that you were able to join us and meet the students there um, because that's something that you grew up doing with your, with your parents and learning about picking the medicines. So yes. yeah, we look forward to doing that again. Absolutely. I love so Yes. Yeah. And there's so many, there's so much out there, but you can't go like I can't just walk out my door to go pick medicine because the the uh, crops, like the farmers put in these crops and they spray them with all kinds of pesticides and herbicides and all that spray. They spray the weeds and then they put the fertilizer and it all washes down into the into the creeks and the rivers around this area. So you, in order to find medicine that's gonna work, you have to go way far in the North country where there's no, none of that stuff like the, all the herbicides and pesticides and the pollution. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to go a long ways in the bush, way back in the bush to find the right medicine that's going to work for whatever ails you. Yeah, that's what we always did. I always had to go in the bush and the berries and all that stuff was just so abundant in those days. And now 
nowadays you can barely ever find a wild strawberry or a wild raspberry or anything and it's sad very sad we'll have to book a road trip one day yes sure. yeah. yes um, some of the other really cool resources that we were able to get from the um, from the Rupert's Land Center were these little cards and they're a great tool for those that want to know about the the main key points of the Métis people so they're a really um, quick read so these cards will be available at both the Lloydminster and Vermilion campuses for students to, to come and pick up and those will be your cards. Um, and I always know where to get more if we run out. So for those of you that are interested in coming to get the little package of cards that talk about the, the Métis culture, feel free to stop on by. Okay, and another thing we wanted to mention, or is it, Towards the end now? No, yeah, you can. Okay, because you wanted to say about. I just wanted to, to talk about my Metis card to the students who I know there's a lot of you students out there that are Metis, but you never knew you were Metis till you were adults because a lot of in the old days nobody wanted to be Metis. You know, they always hid their identity. And the, if a mother was Métis and she was married to a white person, they would tell her not to tell the kids they were Métis because the kids would have a hard time. The, the kids at school would pick on them because they were Métis. And so a lot of the Métis, which is very sad, had to hide their identification. And a lot of the people never did tell their kids that they were Métis. So there's so many Métis, well, adults to, today out there that don't even know they're Métis and they don't know anything about their, their history or their heritage. And so that's why I agreed to come on here because I want to help people that don't know anything about their heritage. And, and it's sad because you have to find out when you're an adult who you are. And a lot of people go through life not finding their place in the world, not knowing who they are. And that's such a sad thing. So it doesn't matter how old you are or what nationality you are. If you can find your roots, you'll find your place here on earth and your, your, your families and, your, and what the Métis people fought to become a nation within a nation in this here Canada and yeah so you go ahead and and there's so much um, now you have the internet and social media and you can look up anything now so you could there's places where you can go to find your roots um, and also there's places where you can go like to Shelley at the Lakeland College to help you. Um, you just have to go back in your lineage to find who your grandmother or your grandfather, one, one of your great grandparents have to be Métis. And then you, you can get your Métis card. And this, I'm just gonna show you what my Métis card looks like. If you can, oh, I got it upside down. If you want to know. Can you put it, put it up there for them? I'm not sure how clear that will be, but it just shows you, it's kind of like a, a plastic identification card. So this card here is, um, it's just like the status cards that First Nations people get to, to prove that they are status. Um, a Métis card, their, um, I, I guess it proves your proves that you're Métis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and different provinces have different cards. Like this is an Alberta Métis card, and uh, and then you have an ID number. It's uh, it's not like a status card where you get you don't have to pay tax if you live on a 
reserve or mm -hmm. it's uh you don't get free health care or really it's just a card that you can get some help with school and stuff because for education and and it's just a card to prove who you are like my granddaughter has blonde hair light blonde hair and uh and she says she's Métis and her grandmother is from Métis Settlement Fishing Lake. And they don't believe that she's Métis. She looks white because her mother is white. And so she has to pull out her Métis card and she has to show them. And, and she says, see, this is my Métis card. I am Métis. So this is what this is for. And it's you know it proves that you you are who you are a part of the Métis, Métis people yeah. and someday we you know there's there's a lot of good things happening in the Métis communities the Métis people are standing together and they're they want to be recognized whereas they don't want to hide their their identity anymore they want to be recognized for who they are and what they've done for this country of Canada and the United States too. I guess there's a lot of Métis people in the United States too, but I just know about the Canadian ones. Yeah. So this is the card, this is the Alberta card. And I, I'm pretty sure ever whatever province you were born in, I think that's where you go to get your Métis card. Yeah. And if anybody's interested in, um, looking into whether or not they have Métis heritage. Um, that starts with an application. You would have to fill out that application, which I have copies of that. I have hard copies as well as I've got the, um, the, the links as well. And I would be able to help you out with that paperwork. Once that paperwork is filled out, then we would send it off to the uh, province in which you're applying for your Métis status with. And if, if you're unsure of how to look back on your lineage, Vina is a great resource. She's helped many people and she understands how, how that application process moves along. So um, she's offered to be that, that, that valuable resource for any student who is, is looking into um, getting their Métis status. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's got any questions about that, um, feel free to reach out to me directly and we can, we can get you started. Like Vina said, there, there are things that are, um, that are a benefit for Métis people who have, who are registered as, Mé as Métis. Um, there's some funding available for schooling. There's also some Métis housing options available. Each region of the Métis Nation has different programs that, that kind of run within that region. So it, it all looks so different depending on where you live. So now is our question period. If anybody has any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat as well and we'll get to those questions here. So um, these are just some of the references that I use throughout the PowerPoint presentation just to give anybody who is wanting to know more about um, the background of history, that's where you can find it. So it looks like we've got some questions here in the chat. So Vina, the ESC class, which is the Employment Skills Enhancement class, says hello. Hello. And Michelle from the, Michelle Hogan is the instructor for the Native Studies 110 class. They say hello. Um, 
Um, just some comments. Loving the stories. Thank you for sharing. Anytime. Um, another comment. Uh, question from Larry Lee in the ESE class. Vina, you often talk about stories, lessons from your maternal mother's side. Was that common for children to relate more with the maternal side than your paternal side? Yes. For for the girls, uh, we uh, we spent more time with our mothers, and we listened. Like we we worked with her. We would work together, pick berries, do everything with our mothers, and the the fathers did more with the boys. Like. Uh, take, they would go hunting, big game hunting. And us girls, like my mother, we would do the, like the, we would do the little game hunting, like the rabbits and the, and the prairie chickens and stuff like that. So we would tr go with, with our mother and check the snares and, and then the boys would do the fishing and we would have to do the, the, the women all did the gutting and the butterfly of the fish and the drying and all that stuff. So the girls always did whatever the mothers did, us the, the young girls. So that's why the young girls, I guess that's probably why I know what my mother taught me because she, the, the young girls all had to do the work of mother, like the house cleaning. And I'm gonna tell a story about what my mother told me when I was maybe 14 or 15. Like they always prepared the girls for marriage. So we had to do all the housework and all the cooking and, cleaning and everything, that was our chores. Well, hauling wood in too, but the boys cut the wood, but the girls had to haul it in. Anyway, I'm gonna tell you a story, not that I'm prejudiced or my mother probably was, I don't know, because in those days, but anyway, we had to make bannock just about every day because there was a lot of men in our family and uh, the, we were a big family. So my mom thought it was time I have to learn now to make bannock because that was what girls do, make bannock. So I made this bannock and I guess, or she was busy doing something else and I worked it too much and the bannock was harder than a rock when they came out of the oven. And my mother said, oh my God, girl, don't ever marry an Indian. And I said, why? You'd have black eyes every day because you can't even make bannock. And you know, the Indian guys, she's used the word Indian in those days. It was, that's what everybody used. She said, you know, because the, we were in the settlement and, and uh, across the lake was a reserve. And, and, uh, and to the east of us was another reserve, and to the south of us was a town. And so she said, I would have black eyes every day because my husband, if I would have married an Indian, would give me black eyes, beat me because they liked their bannock nice and soft, not hard like this one, she said. So I had to do a lot of practicing and I never did get it really down pat. So I get, I remember, I guess I can't marry an Indian because nobody wants black eyes every day because you can't make bannock. So I married a white man. <laughs> That's my story. Thank you. 
and the way we do it. Okay, we got a couple of questions here. So, from Christine. Hi, Vina. My brother in law just became a Yankee Todd and can breathe their shit. So comment from Dave King, can you hear me better? Okay, sorry about that. So um, comment from Dave King, my brother-in-law just received his Métis card as he researched his lineage and found out his great grandfather was a famous Métis. Relating to your story, his problem was that his mother didn't want to share the fact that she was Métis. It makes sense now. Absolutely. Like you said, it, there's so much hiding that went on and, and just being ashamed. Um, and that's something that, you know, in, in other, like in, in my First Nations culture as well, like, especially my generation, like there was so much um, hiding and you just wanted to be ashamed of being, of being who you were because you wanted to fit in you wanted to make sure that you didn't miss out on any opportunities that the rest of mainstream society had so you just you learned how to be that chameleon and just blend in right mm -hmm. so now it's getting a lot better it is getting so much better now but when we were kids when we were young we weren't allowed to go to the reserve which was across the lake because the I, I'm just gonna say like what my grand my parents said. They we were all called Indians and half breeds. There was no natives and Métis people in those days. We were Indians and half breeds because we were half breeds. The Indians didn't want us over there because we were half breeds, and and we had to be very careful we couldn't go we hardly ever went to town i remember as a kid maybe going to town maybe three times with with our parents because the white people didn't want us either didn't want to be around us because we were to that to the white people we were indians and to the indians we were white people so nobody really wanted we didn't fit in anywhere so that's the reason why a lot of people hid their heritage. They didn't want to be, they didn't want to be um, Métis or natives. And, and uh, we didn't know too much about our dad because he, uh, my mom always said, he's an Indian, but he wants to be a half breed because the half breeds could go to the bar and the Indians couldn't go to the bar. So he, he, he would say he was a half breed and then he'd get to go to the bar and drink beer. Mm -hmm. In those days, I don't know what year that would have been in the maybe fifties, I guess, 1950s when the native people couldn't go in the bar, in the bars. Yeah. And then the, the but the half breed people could go in. Mm -hmm. So, so he so we still to this day don't know if he really was native or half breed or metis so yeah so and and i'll tell you another story about my friend's mother um 
I don't know when they started going around the census people, the sense, you know, they would go around taking census, like how many people lived in this house and what religion you were and what nationality you were. So anyway, the census people were going around. Maybe that was, what year did they start doing that? I don't remember. Okay. I'm not sure when they started taking census. Maybe they did all the time, but I don't know. Anyway, this lady was taking census. So she went to this house and uh, she was asking how many lived here and what nationality you were. And she asked, the mother, what nationality are you? And she, the mother looked at her husband and, and her husband said, just tell them. So she said she was a half breed and she started crying and she cried and she cried. And my two friends, they didn't understand why their mother was crying because that was the first time in her life she ever admitted to being a half-breed. In those days, it was half-breeds, Métis, then later on, and or Machif. Machif is really the word for, the natives used Machif, we were Machif, but the French people said we were Métis. So that's where the Machif language comes from, is the Machif people, that would be the half-breeds. Mm -hmm. so we've got a um, question here from Larry Lee. He said, Vina, you may have already answered this, but how does the Canadian government recognize Métis for benefits? Differ from the way it recognizes other First Nations or Inuit people? Well, we're not really under the federal government. The Métis people, the, the um, Indigenous people are federal. The Métis people are provincial. So, um, so we just go to our provincial government, like if, if Shelley was from Saskatchewan, like if she had a Métis card from Saskatchewan, she would go to her Saskatchewan government. Me being, I'm from Alberta, I have an Alberta Métis card. I would go to the Alberta government. We are not, we are not federal yet, but we are in negotiations with the government, the federal government, that because we are, we want to be federal like the, but, like everybody, like the the indigenous people, why can't we be federal under the federal government? Why can't we be recognized as Canadian, not just province to province? We want to be federal. So that's what um, our um, Métis leader, Audrey Putra, that's what she's fighting for, meeting with the federal government because we want to be federal instead of just provincial. Hope that helps you. For sure. And I've got a question here from Josh. Was it the French or indigenous people who ultimately invented or created the colorful sash? Well, this, uh, the, um, it was really invented by the, it was similar. It was invented by the French people in France. And, um, but then the, uh, the Métis people revi revised it and made it stronger and different. They, that's how they, they did a lot of things, the half-breed people, because they, uh, looked at how other people and they thought oh i could i could make that and i could make it a lot better mm -hmm. like it took like i can't remember if it was seven or eight hundred hours to weave the women to weave a metis sash because they use sinew i don't know i'll explain sinew is the back back strap of the 
animal, like deer or moose or whatever, and they would peel that off the hide and it was tough as nails, the sinew that they used and they would dry it and they used it for a lot of, they could color it too. Like they would, um, they would use uh, wild berries or leaves or stuff like that. Like these red berries, I can't remember what they were called, but they would soak the sinew after they had dried it, they would soak it in this water to make the different colors of the sinew. And that's their version of the sash. So it was stronger than the, than the sash that the French made, which was just uh, used of, I don't know, whatever they used, wool or, or cotton. So that, that's how the traditional Métis sash was made but it was kind of like a version of the French mm -hmm. sash, but only they made it better and stronger. Yeah. So Josh um, further says, I have an interesting connection with the sash due to it being part of the French Canadian celebration, Carnival de Quebec. My Catholic French elementary St. Thomas cel celebrated when I was younger and they still do, a more abridged version of it and when worn the colored sash. And we wore the colored sash. Thanks for sharing, Josh. Are there any other questions that um, people want to ask? We've got about 15 more minutes. Um, Carol Thunderchild, I meant show us the Red River jig. We believe in you, Shelly. That is funny, Kara. Maybe next time. <laughs> well, I'll have Shelly and me dance the Red River jig next time. I'll, I'll get the music for the Red, the, the middle music for the Red River jig. I do have it somewhere oh, in boy. the house here. So Shelly and I will do the Red River jig for the, our next session. Then we'll have a bannock making competition. Yes, just to see. <laughs> well, she'll probably be there with the bannock because I still to this day can't make that. Well, I try. I'm getting a bit better at it. I am getting a bit. My family loves. I put. I make my grandgirls come, and I make the traditional uh, Métis hamburger soup and bannock. But mm -hmm. I put cheese i grate cheese in my bannock and i make biscuits instead of making one big bannock yeah. i make it into biscuits and my grand girls they just love grandma's bannock with cheese in the in the bannock and uh, my hamburger soup oh I, I could talk a little bit about the uh, traditional cuisine of the metis people yeah um well, the bannock is one thing. The bannock and the, uh, well, the wild meat. We always ate wild meat, but we always, it was always so good, the wild meat that we ate. Like we ate rabbits and prairie chickens and fish and deer and moose and whatever, whatever we had we would eat it and it was so good and we used to can fish my mom well us girls and mom we used to can fish we used to can wild because we didn't have any fridges in those days so we can can deer meat and moose meat and and my mom would uh, and we always had potatoes and most of the time eggs because we had our own chickens we had eggs and potatoes and we would pick uh choke cherries were such an abundance in those days and my mother would uh we had a flat rock and then 
another little small rock and my mother would put a tea towel over the flat rock and we would we we would pound the choke cherries to break the the uh, core what do you call those the things seed. the seed mm -hmm. in the choke cherries and my mom would can them can the choke cherries after we got all the stones crushed with the two rocks and she would and we would use the the uh, choke cherries for, my mom would cook fry them up fry them in lard and put some um, fl mixed flour with it and by morning it would thicken like whatever we didn't and we'd have that choke cherries and potatoes for a meal and then in the morning there would be some choke cherries left so we had them choke cherry sandwiches to go to school and we just loved them because we didn't know any different. And still to this day, I think back how good those sandwiches were of, of crushed choke cherry sandwiches for school. And like the summers as a child, I hated the summers because all we did would work from spring to fall. All we did was work, 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 preparing for the winter picking berries, doing garden work and and doing everything. We had to do everything to prepare for the, all summer we prepared for the winter. And my mom, when us girls would get lazy and didn't want to do, do go, go pick berries for, and we had to be up early at like five o'clock in the morning because we had to be the first ones at the berry patch because a lot of people would, had whatever bear, uh, close, whatever berry patch was close everybody would go there so we had to beat the other berry pickers and uh, i should just unplug that. That's okay. anyway so and uh and my mom would tell us you get out there to the berry patch because those berries are going to taste damn good in the dead of winter so we would get out to the berry patch and pick those berries because they're going to taste good in the dead of winter and she was right they sure did taste good whenever we had company come for tea she'd always bring up a jar of fruit or not fruit berries that we yeah. and us kids would know that we'd get a little dish of berries because there was company coming mm -hmm. so that was something to look forward to for sure. Choke cherries are one of my favorites too. Yeah. 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 We used to make choke cherry syrup and and have that on pancakes. But the real choke cherries like squish were good. Yeah. 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 Uh, just a couple of comments. Um, Janine Faithful would like to know your recipe for your bannock. Oh, I don't know if you would want my recipe for my bannock <laughs> because usually we never had recipes. We never, like my bannock never tastes the same every time. Like uh, we would just kind of go by feel. You know, your dough had to be just, you just would feel it. Like if, if you had, if you were, if you were having like five people for supper, well, you'd think, okay, I'll put five cups of flour and maybe a couple of tablespoons of bacon powder and salt and, and then the water, you just kind of added it as you went along to make the field. You didn't want it dry. You didn't want it too sticky. So you, you just kind of, I don't know, there was no recipe. Ever, everybody made it different. And then every time I, oh, well, maybe I put too much bacon powder, maybe I'll put a little bit less. And lard, we always use lard, like hard lard for our bannock. Nowadays, nobody uses hard lard. They say, oh, there, there's too much, what do you call that, in the fat. Yeah. But, you know, um, I think there's more of that stuff in the, in the oils that we use nowadays. Mm -hmm. Then there is in the hard lard, like a little bit of hard lard never killed you. Or bacon grease. We always saved the bacon grease and put that in the bannock. Oh my God, that was good. And nowadays, they everybody throws out the bacon grease. 
we never threw out bacon grease. We used that for, you know, soups, put, put bacon grease in the soup to give it the bacon flavor. We used it for bannock, we used it for frying fish and everything we used bacon grease for and hard lard. Hmm. Hard lard. We never had cooking oil like, you know, all the different brands of cooking oil they got now. We never had that. Just hard lard we used for everything. Cakes and bread and bannock and everything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you want if if you want you could you could put anything in the dough too, like raisins. My mom used to make raisin bannock. It was so good. You put raisins and you put a little bit of sugar in the in the bannock dough and you have raisin bannock. And it's so good for breakfast, toasted raisin bannock. Yeah. just better than any <laughs> raisin bread bought in the store. Yeah. So you can just put, it's very versatile dough to mm -hmm. use it for, and we used to fry it. Oh, that was good too, fried bannock. Um, there's all different kinds of names, like the French version of that, we used fried bannock, like we used bannock dough to fry, but we just didn't put the lard in the dough because you fried it in lard. Mm -hmm. And then the fried bread was came from the French people, like because they made bread, bread dough, mm -hmm. and they would fry that, and that was really good. Then that's another thing the Métis people adapted from the French food was the bread because we didn't have anything like yeast, anything like that. So we just made the the bannock. Yeah. But um, they adapted the, the, the fried bannock, mm -hmm. uh, our fried bread dough, and that is so good too, uh, fried bread dough. We ate a lot of that too, yeah. because a lot of times mom would make a big batch of bread and um, like it wouldn't be ready by the time us kids come home from school or for supper. Like if she started late after she got her other outside chores done, she'd start the bread and she'd fry it. Oh my God, it was so good. Never forget that. Makes me hungry just thinking about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so yeah, I, I would always make dough gods. When we go camping, I always bring my ingredients for fry bread. And then I would tell our camping crew well you come for breakfast and you bring whatever you want on the dough gods uh, if you want cheese you bring cheese if you want jam you bring jam if you want peanut butter mm -hmm. or whatever and, you, and everybody from the camp they would have a little jar or something under their arm coming for dough gods for breakfast and, and then they put everything on the table and you had your choice of syrup or or jam mm -hmm. or peanut yeah. butter or whatever. It was so much fun. For sure. Um, so one other comment here from Darren Mitzwing. Thank you for the presentation, Vina and Shelley. You're welcome. You're very Thanks welcome. Thanks for joining everybody. Um, from the last name, Grief, I believe it's, yeah, Grief. Um, love that you call them dough gobs too. Mm, the best. That's awesome. So um, I just wanted to kind of just let So that concludes our that concludes our presentation on the virtual Métis talks. Can I just say yes, one more thing? absolutely. Sorry, I just want one more thing. I put my ego here. Oh, here. I just want to tell you about the ego. It's so important to the native and the Métis people, and um, my elder years ago told us that the eagle's wings, when the man and the woman are like the eagle's equal, like the eagle's wings, there'll be peace and harmony in the world. Till then, no, there won't be peace in the world. But so we always have an eagle because they are so 
important to the Métis people. The, uh, our indigenous side, the ego is very, very uh, spiritual. Thank you, Marla. Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Brandy said, thank you so much. Really enjoyed the presentation. You're welcome, Brandy. Thanks for joining. And Michelle, thank you for the wonderful talk. You're welcome, Michelle. I hope your class enjoyed it. So um, just to wrap up and conclude our presentation, on behalf of the Lakeland College Indigenous Support Services and staff um, and students that I support throughout our academic year, I just wanted to present to you a blanket and a thank you card for, oh, wow. for sharing, sharing your culture with us. It's very valuable and important to, to get to spend the afternoon with you and just to, to get to know you and to share that with the people that have joined us today. So thank you. Wow, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, wow. And on behalf of the Indigenous study bodies at Lake Land Cottage, thank you for sharing your Métis culture with us. We appreciate all you, your time and, and stories. Thank you so much, Shelley. That's beautiful. And thank you all for taking the time to listen to what an old Métis women, woman has <laughs> to say about the storytelling. I have so many stories that I could tell. Once I get going, I don't know when to shut up. Because <laughs> I remember them as a child. And nothing was ever written down. And that's why we have a hard time uh, with the history of the Métis people because everybody has a different version of the history like you hear from the french people you hear from the indigenous they all have a different version of the metis people so i said no matter how flat you make a pancake it still has two sides and that's what i think about the metis people we have two sides we have the the european side and we have the indigenous side so we're two-sided people. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, you just can't, you know, you can tell a story, but it's just been passed down from generation to generation. Nothing is ever written down by the Métis people. So we don't know all their true history. We just know what they tell us, you know, what, what our family, what our parents and our grandparents told us. So, and when you're a young kid, you don't want to hear that stuff. You know, you got other. You want to get outside and, and get playing or something. You don't want to hear that. But when you get older, and then you think, "Geez, I wish I'd have listened closer to what Grandma was saying," because now she's gone, and whatever secrets or whatever stories are buried with her in a graveyard. So, my advice to all you young people. Please listen to what your grandparents have to say or try and write it down so you can pass that information on to your kids because then it'll be written down. Whereas my grandparents, even my parents, there was nothing written down. We just had to go by what we heard or what we knew for sure, what we lived. So try and tell their stories. Um, so with that, I thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, that concludes our presentation. Thank you.